And up next, we have Greg Hallinan joining us. Uh, Greg is a professor at Caltech, and he is director of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Um, and his research combines studying the magnetic activity in stellar and planetary systems and uh, searching for radio transients. Um, and he's here today to tell us all about DSA 2000, a radio survey camera, and what that has in store for the, um, the next few years of uh, transient astronomy. So uh, take it away, Greg. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for organizing all this. It's been amazing to, to be here. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk about DSA 2000, um, which I call here a radio survey camera. I'll explain what I mean by a radio camera uh, in a few minutes. Um, first, what is it? Um, it's a, it's a radio survey instrument and multi-messenger discovery instrument. It's really, multi-messenger astronomy is one of the key pillars for the, for, for the telescope. It will consist of 2,000 five-meter dishes in a valley in Nevada, spanning about 19 by 15 kilometers, operating in the 0.7 to 2 gigahertz band, so sort of classical centimeter wave radio astronomy. Space resolution, about three arc seconds, and it is highly optimized for surveys across the board. Uh, we're targeting first light in 26, whoops. And our key surveys in 27 to 32. Uh, the design has been funded by Schmidt Futures. Our, 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 our pathfinders have been funded by NSF, but the design for this telescope has been funded by Schmidt Futures, and the construction cost is about 160 million. Okay, so uh, I'm going to direct your, your, your eyes to the right first to show where we sort of excel as a project. This shows service speed in the y axis versus uh, continuum sensitivity in the x axis. And up in the top right hand corner, you might recognize the NGV and SK mid, for example. They're sort of the, the radio ELTs. Uh, on the top, we are really uh, uh, optimized for service speed. Uh, in fact, when I mo tell most of my colleagues about this instrument, they usually say, oh, you're building the radio Rubin. So that's, that's what I've heard in most institutes when I, when I mention the project. Uh, it's about a thousand times the state of the art service speed compared to what we have in the US and a hundred times the state of the art in the world today. Uh, it will survey 31,000 square degrees to about 500 nanojanskis. Um, that's AB magnitude 24.7 for those who prefer those units. That's a billion radio sources over five years as a factor of 100 increase compared to all surveys today combined. Uh, it will include uh, spectropolarimetry as well, too. We will have put in, in spectral line, we'll have H1 for 10 million galaxies. Uh, we'll have polarization for all sources above a certain threshold in signal to noise. And then in the fast time domain, about 10 to the 5 pulsars and FRBs and then about a million slow transients. Now, the enabling technology for us is, to, is twofold. First, we have a new generation of digital back end called a radio camera that makes images in real time. And the other is a cryo-free antenna and receiver. And I'll describe those momentarily. All right, so what are we doing for our survey? Most of the time is doing a cadenced all sky survey. That's familiar to many of you here. Um, we'll cover the 31,000 square degrees over uh, about 13 epochs. The first epoch will be a deep reference getting down to about 50% of the final depth of the survey, and then 12 additional epochs with some sort of randomized sampling, learning from, from Ruben and other experiments and how best to do that. 25% of the time will be spent doing pulsar timing. We, we will be the primary instrument for the nanograv collaboration to do US-based pulse, uh, US pulsar timing. We will, of course, be able to access the other functionality of the telescope and be able to image those fields down to a depth of about 200 nanojanskis. And then finally, about 10% of the time is shared between doing follow-up of LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA compact binary coalescences. And then when we haven't got a high priority target, we're gonna, we're gonna hit our deep fields, which, which are really primarily the Rubin deep fields, actually, where we, can, where we can access them. Now, unlike other radio telescopes, we do not produce visibilities. And I'll describe how that happens uh, in, a, in a, a few minutes. We produce images. Every single pointing is of duration 10.2 minutes and produces 14K spectral and polarimetric images. That includes continuum images where we'll have a combined depth of two microjanskis over about 10 square degrees. Our field of view is about the same as Ruben actually. Uh, in those continuum images, you'll detect about 100,000 sources uh, and you'll have 10 frequency points across that continuum. But then we will also have spectral line in that same field of view um, tracing H1 at three different resolutions. For our own galaxy, we'll have a frequency, uh, our velocity resolution of 0.25 kilometers per second. Then in the local universe, out to 100 megaparsecs, we'll have a velocity resolution of 1.75 kilometers per second for 4,000 channels. And then out to redshift one, we'll have um, uh, uh, redshift, um, sorry, we have velocity resolution between 28 and 56 kilometers per second. 
Uh, in all cases, we will have full polarization data uh, spanning uh, the full band with 605 channels. And then commensally, we will do fast time domain searches for fast radio bursts and pulsars. All right, uh, so what's our data archive look like? Uh, most radio data archives right now are pretty um, trivial compared to what's, what's been done um, in the optical and IR, for example, and of, of course, what's, what's been planned for Ruben, for example. And what we're, because we're producing Im image data for the first time in real time for Radio Telescope, it really offers us the ability to leverage all of what's been developed in the optical and IR into the radio. So we are planning to build a, an archive with all our data products. There, they, all our data is fully public with no proprietary period. Uh, that, and that will include all of our continuum data, uh, where we'll have both um, uh, 13 epochs, uh, 10 spectral windows, and full polarization. And then we'll, it will also include, uh, uh, for example, shown on the top left, uh, you'll have those spectral image cubes in, cubes in H1, where you will have two dimensions in, 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 in spatial and, of course, frequency, to be able to trace through and look at, at galaxies. Uh, we will, we will in include, for the FRBs, we'll have profiles. For the pulsars, we'll have folded profiles. And when you go to the image plane and, and our final products, it's actually comparable to a reasonably sized OIR survey, nowhere near as large a data volume as, as Ruben, for example. Our baseline is three data, full data releases over, th over five years. That may increase, as well as quick look access to time domain products uh, on a time scale of a week or two after the data collection. All right. I want to, before I talk about the science case in depth, I want to talk about the enabling technology. How can we claim to build 10 times SKA service speed for a fraction of the cost? And it boils down to uh, two technologies. The first one is our antenna. We build not big, huge structures like the VLA. We have small antennas, uh, a five meter aperture. We've been, we've been actually developing this from, for a decade now. And we're on generation four. And I'll describe, I mentioned uh, generation three momentarily. But the key point here is we're building low cost antennas that are very performant. And most importantly, they, they, they provide excellent sensitivity despite having no cryogenic cooling. Uh, when you get to a small aperture, what dominates the cost is the, is the need to cool your low noise amplifier, for example. We no longer have that requirement because we have a low noise amplifier that operates at room temperature. So here is the design on the left of the antenna. Uh, I'm first going to maybe just talk about the, the uh, receiver. So we have a feed and LNA that's already debuted in our previous generation telescopes and has been modified. Uh, for the feed, we built it at very low cost. We call this the quad ridge cake pan feed. Quad ridge defines the structure that gives us the wide band performance. Cake pan is because we literally buy cake pans from a company called Fat Daddy uh, to build these feeds. So we build them for a few hundred dollars each. That's actually an example of two of those fat daddy or cake pans. And they've worked with us for the last few years and provide those at very low cost and they're amazing. And then the real magic is on the bottom right, which is essentially a low noise amplifier that we build for a few hundred dollars each, but it delivers seven Kelvin noise temperature at room temperature, relying on commercial transistors that are designed to operate at much higher frequencies. Uh, these have been demonstrated and operate on our current generation telescope. And now we have about 25 of these prototypes for the next generation. The antenna uh, has is also a pretty unique design. It has very stringent requirements, and that's tied into how the radio camera operates. But its pointing has to be one arc minute RMS. So it doesn't sound like much, but for a radio telescope of this cost, it's pretty stringent. The second is our surface accuracy is extremely precise. It's lambda over 100, a factor of five more than you typically need for a radio telescope. And that's just, once again, tied to the requirements for the radio camera. The membrane is essentially an aluminum hydroformed reflector. And then we've got an RF shield to minimize spillover. Um, the turn ahead and the, and the uh, backing structure is designed by Minex Corporation, Mike, Matt Fleming and Michael Weiss. We will have five of these online by the end of this year, uh, funded by Schmidt Features. We, uh, because of the requirements we have for the reflector, uh, we don't want to cut the reflector and transport it. We actually want to manufacture them in situ. We have built and designed um, a full-scale hydroforming facility at Avro, at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And we are now forming currently half-size reflectors. In about six weeks, we'll be rolling off full-size reflectors that we hydroform locally uh, at Avro. Um, and i got loads of fun videos I can show about that. All right, so performance-wise, here's what we expect for total system temperature at Zenith 
for the DSA 2000. This includes the LNA we already have built and simulations of the performance of the reflector and the uh, and the shield, the RF shield. Our requirement is 25 Kelvin. At Zenith, we exceed that by many Kelvin. As you move away from Zenith, you increase spillover. It's three Kelvin on top of this at, at, at declination zero. And at our lowest declination, it's about seven Kelvin more, which still meets our specification across the entire band. So that's our antenna. The other big technology is what we call a radio camera. Uh, and I want to kind of give some back, background on why we need a radio camera first. So uh, in radio astronomy, when you do interferometry, you're working with a broken mirror. Okay, the example I'm showing here on the left is a very large array. You're only sampling a small fraction of the incoming radiation that hits your synthesized aperture, which means you're actually effectively missing information. Okay, the resulting point spread function for the very large array, which has been an amazing telescope to work with, is shown on the right. And what we do in, in, in uh, radio astronomy, we, the output from the VLA uh, comes from a device called a correlator, and it produces visibilities. And they have a Fourier transform relationship with the true sky brightness. We don't make images in real time because we have to deal with the problem that we are missing information. What we have to do is we have to you know, calibrate, you know, edit the data. But most importantly, to recover information missing, we have to do nonlinear deconvolution which is not well suited to an optimized streaming pipeline, for example. And even with the VLA, which went through a major upgrade a decade ago, the community has been struggling with the data volume it produces. And it is not a large data volume compared to what's coming. So this shows up a plot of the output visibility data from telescopes that are planned or in existence um, over the next few years. The SKA at NGVLA will produce a border an exabyte of data per year that they have to archive and store. Now, our telescope seems to make the problem much worse. By going to a much larger array and the data volume sc scales is N squared, you end up with something like 20 exabytes a year of that data, data product. By the way, the raw data to the system is 0 0.8 zettabytes per year, which is about 25% of the world's IP traffic currently. Um, but the data product we would normally have to, have to archive and, and serve is 20 exabytes a year. Even on storage costs, that would completely dominate our budget. In fact, um, way more than we're paying for the telescope itself. But the good news is we're not actually storing those data. And that's because we've solved this problem. So the top, I'm showing again the VLA, its point spread function, and an image before deconvolution. On the bottom, I'm showing the same for the DAC 2000. And we basically have filled the aperture. We have complete UV coverage in, in radio summary parlance. The point spread function is shown in the center. And here's an image on the right without deconvolution. So we are able to remove visibility-based deconvolution from the pipeline. We still do image plane deconvolution. That allows us to now build a deterministic stream processor. So the GPUs that we use for our correlator, we can now do all the other steps inside that same digital backend. And this is what it looks like on the top. So um, this is a, a schematic of the radio camera. All this hardware exists in, in prototype form. But we sample the signals, and we channelize them in an FPGA. Um, those data exist per antenna, where you've got thousands of channels. Now you've got to go through what's called a corner turn, a big transpose, where you've got to go from uh, per antenna data to per channel for every antenna. Uh, and and we enter, then we enter into GPUs. And inside those GPUs, we do the normal processing that happens inside a digital backend, uh, a radio camera, uh, what we, uh, sorry, correlator. What we do is we do the cross modification. But then we also flag, grid, and image essentially in real time inside that backend. That is a huge amount of processing. It actually consists of 5,000 GPUs. Uh, and these are, the, once again, the same ones that Kevin mentioned. Ada architecture, we're, we're going to use an RTX 4000 in our baseline because it's low power, but it's about the same cost as the gaming ones. I agree completely with your analysis. Um, this is already existing in a, in, in a prototype stage. Now, we already have examples of Pathfinder instruments for both of these technologies. On the left, we have the DSA, uh, uh, 110 DSA that, that, that uh, demonstrates the antenna. And on the, on the right, we have the LWA, the long wave in the array for demonstrating our radio camera prototype. I haven't got much time to, to, to demonstrate all this, but the key point is um, the DSA 110, for example, uh, um, already has LNAs 
uh, installed that operate at room temperature that give us a, a, uh, a system temperature of 25 Kelvin with no cryogenic cooling. It, it already has, has trebled the, the total number of localized fast radio bursts. In fact, there's a conference on right now in Flatiron where, where they're all talking about the, the science from DSA 110. On the right, I'm showing just, just images of um, about 36 of those first localized FRBs. Uh, and you know, I'm showing the optical data because really that's the, that's the important context. Where are the host galaxies? What redshift? And that allows us to tease out like, wh where, do, where do FRBs come from? And, and also, for example, use them as probes of the intergalactic medium and certain galactic medium. All right, next up, I'm gonna briefly show just an image from the LWA. This is just finished construction. This is an array of antennas where we've installed a prototype radio camera and it images the entire sky every 10 seconds. This is three levels of zoom on the same image. And we do this continuously all the time, imaging the entire sky. Uh, the data rate from this telescope is 100 terabytes per day, but it's all processed in real time. It's built to do exoplanets, but it serves as the pathfinder for the, uh, uh, for the uh, radio camera technology. All right, I wanna come on and move on to the science we're gonna do with the, the DSA 2000. Okay, so we have three main pillars for our science. Multi-messenger astronomy, our cosmic history, and the dynamic radio sky that flow to seven key science projects. They map pretty well to the uh, uh, priorities of the Decadal Survey science-wise. If you want to learn more about the science and you know get a lot more detail, I invite you to go to the latest science conference we had in March that describes all the science and the synergies. We had, we had great talks here about Rubin, for example. Um, and Matthew Bales dropped the quote that it can keep every radio astronomer on the planet busy for about a decade. Okay, so uh, key, science, uh, key science project one, uh, I, wanna, I wanna briefly talk about is pulsar timing. It really is one of the ma main pillars for the project. Uh, I don't need to introduce the, the, the figure on the left thanks, uh, uh, because Kevin's already gone through this. The key point is that um, at very low uh, frequencies and also uh, pretty uh, a high strain, uh, you can actually use pulsars essentially as a pulsar timing array. And of course we had this really wonderful recent results of the first, Helling's down curve that basically gives the strongest evidence we have to date for a stochastic background from the, you know, from the assembly of all uh, supermassive black hole binaries we have in the universe. The D2000 is gonna greatly improve that. It really now full, you know, you know, takes up the, the mantle that Arecibo had as being the main workhorse for pulsar timing for the US community. Uh, and 25% of the time is gonna be used for pulsar timing and as well as improving uh, the, the quality of our measurement of the Hellings down curve, um, we will also be able to detect the first individual sources within the background and then commence you know, multi-messenger astronomy in that context by being able to do EM follow-up of that population. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, Key Science Project 2 is also multi-messenger astronomy. It's now using this, the telescope as follow-up for binaries detected by LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA uh, the example we, the only example we have, of course, is GW seventeen eight seventeen, which uh, six years later we have we have found no equal. And radio was pretty important, of course. It produced amazing results across the entire spectrum, but radio was very decisive for a number of things. It was the only way we could really get a good picture of the environment uh, of the explosion. Uh, it also is how we confirmed an off-axis short gamma ray burst via VLBI measurements of uh, its proper motion with time. Uh, and 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 uh, finally, it, it was also important for determining the viewing angle to the explosion, and was able to to be used to place strong constraints on H naught, for example. So it really was a very powerful tool. Unfortunately, uh, we have not yet been able to detect another one, uh, and that's because follow up of these events is very hard. Over time, our horizon, the range of these detectors, is getting better. We had no events in O three uh, or uh, or O four to date, and of course. New o o optical and IOR uh, surveys will help that tremendously, including Rubin. The D2000 will be a very powerful uh, instrument for both discovery and follow up of these events uh, for a number of reasons. It's much more, sen uh, well, its field of view is the first thing to highlight. It can actually map the entire localization region for a four detector array or a five detector array in a very short amount of time. Uh, secondly, it can detect the median events to the full range of a five detector array, uh, which, which you know, for example, I'm showing sensitivity on the right for, for the VLA in an hour for GW7817 versus DC2000. Um, and that, that means you can actually detect GW7817 out to the full range 
of a forward detector array. All right, I'm going to not spend much, because it's the, it's the explosive universe session, I'm going to skip discussions of neutral hydrogen. I will say that it's really exciting what we can do with H1. And similarly, what we can do in continuum as well is also pretty spectacular. We can build an amazing rotation measure grid covering the entire sky. Uh, but I want to really instead emphasize what the time domain science is again. And DSA-110 is already localizing fast radio bursts at an unprecedented rate. DSA-2000 will really multiply that by a huge amount. It will actually detect about 10,000 FRBs in a five-year survey. Um, that's really going to build the best picture we have of where matter resides between and around galaxies. So the intergalactic medium and the circumgalactic medium. Uh, and, and that's going to be unprecedented. And the, the other big kind of really high goal we have is to find the first dozen or so strongly lensed FRBs. Now, the synergies here with Rubin, again, are very strong. Um, I showed pictures of DSA-110 FRBs. We've spent many keck nights doing follow-up of those events. You can't do spectroscopy of 10,000 FRBs uh, at the distances we're talking about. It's going to rely on Rubin uh, photo disease to be able to get those distances. Uh, pulsars, we're going to end up discovering something like 20,000 pulsars. So we're approaching an order of magnitude increase in the number of known pulsars, which have been exquisite astrophysical laboratories. That includes more than 3,000 new millisecond pulsars. These are going to be amazing tests of strong field GR. Um, they're going to give amazing constraints on the equation of state of ultra dense matter, for example. Uh, and, and the other, the final science case I want to mention is slow time domain. Been able to come back and look every few months or every few weeks for new slowly evolving transients. And this has actually been a new field over the last few years that has exploded. Uh, the VLA Sky Survey has found thousands of transients, including entirely new populations. Uh, there's candidate orphan GRB afterglows. The first extragalactic pulsar with nebula has been discovered. Um, a, 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 a candidate for a merger driven explosion. These are all, you know not identified via optical or, or higher energy explo explo um, surveys, but via radio surveys. All right, the last thing I want to mention before my time runs out is the site. Where do you build uh, a telescope uh, uh, that needs to be the most sensitive survey instrument on the, on the planet? And this is a, 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 um, a figure that shows essentially the density of cell towers across the US. And if you look here sort of around the Great Basin, Nevada and Utah, you'll see a, a real sparsity in the density of those events. And we are building uh, the day 2000 in this, this area here, looking for valleys with very low levels of radio frequency interference. To do this, we have surveyed every site we can identify across that entire site. There's a, a small team of heroes that have been driving around Nevada for years, measuring that interference. Um, and the best site we have is a site called Spring Valley, Nevada. Um, and the site, is very large, 19 by 15 kilometers. Uh, this is public land managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, the, the spectrum on the bottom shows what you, you, we measured in the valley. It has no cell tower RFI. All, all you can see is very occasional uh, aeronautical RFI and nothing else at all inside our band. Um, so that process away, the, the, I want to give a shout out to Vinan Prayag, who's our, our, uh, uh, just finished his postdoc and has, has done most of the surveying across, that, across the entirety of Nevada. We, he's been doing that alone for weeks at a time, so we, we brought him a special friend to bring with him. All right, my last slide is just covering the timeline. Where are we in the project? Um, we've uh, completed our conceptual design review a year ago. Uh, this year, we're having our preliminary design review in, a, in, a, in November. We submitted our MSRI2 proposal to NSF uh, for construction funds in, uh, in June. And the full proposal is due in December. I got word from NSF this morning that we've been invited to submit a full proposal, so hooray. And we're also going to be asking NSF for some of that funding as well, too. Uh, or sorry, submit features for, that, for funding for construction as well, too. All right, I'm going to leave my summary slide up, and I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Well, we've got time for a couple of questions um, before the discussion for the next session. So let's start with uh, Simon and then Roger. Hi, thanks. This is super exciting. I had two questions. First, could you say a few words about calibration for this kind of direct imaging? 
And then secondly, could you say a few words about possible cosmology applications for DSA data? Absolutely. So um, on the first topic, calibration, the requirement here is we have to calibrate effectively in real time. Now, the good news is that the errors you can tolerate in calibration uh, typically scale uh, with n. So if you think of a very large array, to produce an image of high dynamic range, uh, and our dynamic range requirements are very high. Every image is 10 to the 5 dynamic range. For the VLA, that requires 0 0.01 degree phase errors. So many iterations of self-calibration, you know, knowing your uh, uh, leakage polarization extremely precisely and so on. For our antenna, uh, for our array, because you have a factor of, you know, 2,000 instead of, instead of 27, those, those er the error tolerances per antenna scale linearly within as do the far side lobes of the imaging, image PSF. That's what makes it all possible, really. It's the image, image dynamic range and cal calibration dynamic range that comes with the large N. Now, cosmological application, uh, there's, there's a ton here, including uh, everything from intensity mapping. But what I would like to highlight and uh, that I didn't include is we're actually about to formally adopt a fourth pillar in our, in our key science, um, which is strong gravity um, uh, and the dark sector. And that's because... Uh, in three ways, we are very sensitive to dark matter and dark energy. Dark, dark matter, I think the rotation curves you get for 10 to the 5 galaxies out to a very large distance across a very large range of mass is very powerful. But on the cosmological side, uh, weak lensing actually is within our grasp through the use of a technique called super resolution with, our, with, our, um, with a, an algorithm we've developed that applies deep learning. It's led by uh, Liam Connor and Katie Bauman. There's a paper about this that should give us comparable sensitivity to weak lensing as, for example, Euclid. Um, uh, so, so there is definitely lots of applications uh, a lot, and a lot more that I didn't cover with, with those KSPs. Thanks. Now, Roger. Great. It's um, <clears throat> wonderful that you found such a quiet site today. But of course, 10 years from now, with growing constellations and stuff, it's going to be a challenge. You think you mentioned flagging in your pipeline. Could you say a little more about interference excision, which has got to be key for the future? Completely agree with that. Uh, I, I have great worries about the future of ground-based radio astronomy. And unlike optical uh, IR and other wavelengths, it's not as easy to transport to space at these frequencies in particular. Um, we're working pretty hard with NSF to try to get designation for this site as soon as we can. Um, uh, we are also building into the, the up, you know, in the very early upstream analog signal chain, tunable filters. Uh, that can be tuned anywhere in the band and suppress RFI for about 40 megahertz down by about 40 dB. And that's because we do have significant worry about, for example, orbiting GSM uh, or orbiting LTE rather, if you, if you will, uh, which has been um, granted licensing and has, has been tested in Texas. Um, there's also an emergency, um, uh, it's a set of, of cell towers that have been installed to enable US-wide emergency action response that's also be, you know, going to be deployed. All of these present a threat to our system um, because ultimately if, if the interference environment exceeds what our analog, stick, what our ADC can tolerate, then we lose the entire band, right? So yeah, working with NSF is a big part of this, trying to get designation for the site in, in a fast track way, either as a radio quiet zone, at the very least as a national radio dynamic zone. And Risa. Very exciting. Um, thanks for this great talk. Um, can I just ask a tiny bit more about the static science on the H1 rotation curves? How does the depth compare to other surveys? You mean, how, uh, when you said depth, how sensitive the... How sensitive, yeah. So in terms of the number of sources we'll see compared to even planned surveys, even SKA, which is an amazing telescope, but it's doing... Serve, it's, you know, SKA originally had a survey component to it, a, a separate telescope. Um, something like a factor of a few more galaxies we will see uh, in H1. Um, now, H1 is a particular case where surface brightness is important, right? Um, and there's a, there are great telescopes that are online right now, including Meerkat, that are already making amazing measurements uh, in H1. And in, in those cases, in some, in some cases, that, uh, um, uh, for, you know, they're, they're, they're more sensitive on larger scales because they've got a bigger collecting area and they're not resolving out as much as we are, right? So uh, the key point, I think, is that this has a very particularly strong niche for H1, um, where the resolution is very, very good 
um, and it can trace, you know, for example, rotation curves out to a very large distance. Um, but, it, but there are still other telescopes that have a very complementary sensitivity to maybe, you know, uh, they're more sensitive on a very large scale potential. Great. Well, uh, thank you again, Greg, for sharing the uh, the really exciting SA two thousand with us. Um, I know I for one can't wait for it to uh, to come online. So uh, thanks again. Thanks, Sam.